Hi there, um, I'm going to give you another tutorial about machine learning basics in R. So going back to the, the result from our previous tutorial, we saw that um, we used um, a data table uh, to read in um, a CSV file. This is a SA Heart data set provided by the Elements of Statistics Learning textbook. And so what we have now is we have this X mat, which is a numeric matrix of inputs, and this Y vec which is a vector of binary outputs that we want to learn from. And so yeah, one of the really simplest machine learning algorithms that you could use is the, um, the, the nearest neighbors uh, classifier. And so that's what I'd like to talk about first. But, but before we do that, I want to talk about an important thing that we need to do before we apply mostly any machine learning algorithm, and that's scaling. So um, so if we use the summary function in R, um, let's do summary of keep dt, which was our vector of, uh, sorry, our data table of, of input columns that we wanted to use uh, in our X matrix. And just looking at the summary statistics for each one of these columns, we see that, well, they're on widely different scales. So this one is on the order of 100 units. This one is on the order of, you know, uh, you know, unit, you know, one to zero to thirty. This one is zero to fifteen. This one is on the order of twenty-five or so. You know, these ones, um, these different units. You know, this one is just between zero and one, right? So these different units are on widely different scales, and most machine learning algorithms are going to fail if your data are on widely different scales, and that's because most machine learning algorithms. Um, you know, have some numerical uh, stability, you know, instability issues with data that are like very, um, on very different scales. And so it's always a good idea to try to scale your data before plugging them into a machine learning algorithm. Some algorithms will do that internally anyways, but it's never a bad idea to just do that as a precaution. So, um, you know, and so we can actually try to run this nearest neighbors classification with scaling and without, and we'll probably see that it's not very good without. So let's um, let's keep that in mind as we go ahead. So so usually the first thing in our analysis is you can compute a scale matrix. In R, it's very easy. You compute x dot sc, which is a scaled version of our x matrix. And so then if we use summary on x dot sc. Well, we see that um, we have now the mean of all of the columns is zero. So that's the definition of scaling. The mean is zero, and the standard deviation should be one in every case. So um, that's great. Let's, um, let's now use that in machine learning. So when we do machine learning, we have to do a train test split in the beginning. So we're going to be learning a classifier. And to try to predict who has heart disease in this data set. And essentially, you know, in order to judge whether or not we're doing a good job at predicting heart disease, we have to set aside some of the data as a test set. So let's do that first. And the way that we do that usually is with cross-validation. So with cross-validation, what we do is we, you know, basically as assign some folds. So here I'm going to create something called fold vec, which is going to be um, from going from one to n folds, and it's the same size as the number of rows in our data set, number of observations in our data set. So n folds, this is the number of folds in your k-fold cross-validation, and this can be uh, basically, you know, any number between 5 and 20 is great, and is what people usually do. Um, it doesn't really make a huge difference, and it hopefully shouldn't make a huge difference in terms of your estimation of which algorithm is the best. Here I'm going to just take five, and here I'm going to create our, our fold vec now. Um, and you see, so here in my initial definition of my fold vec, let's let's put this in a data table fold vec just so we can see just a f uh, what a few of these guys look like. You know, so 
it's actually just systematic re repeating the values one two three four five one two three four five all the way down right so we don't want to do that in case there's some systematic um, you know structure to the the CSV file or the the input data that we have so instead what we're going to use is we're going to use sample and sample what that does is it takes a random permutation of all of those numbers so if we see the 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 data now well, you see it's not starting with one, it's got two, three, five, one, four, five, one, four, two, three. You know, so it's going to be a random permutation of um, the numbers between one and five. And actually, it's going every time you run sample, it's going to be a different random permutation. So you see here that you have different numbers now. Now it does start with one, it goes one, four, one, five, four, two, three, et cetera, right? So, um, so one thing that we usually do is we usually set seed. And that, um, what that does is it makes the random generation uh, not random anymore. Because actually, we don't really usually have ra real random numbers on the computer. We have pseudo-random numbers, and they're only random um, if you don't set the seed. If you set the seed, they become deterministic. Now, so if we take, you know, let's just take the first few elements of that fold bag. Let's do the same thing again, set the seed, and then run that sample. So now we see, um, let's, you see very clearly that we're getting the same random assignment for the few, first few guys every time. Okay, so now we've done that fold assignment. What we might want to do is we might want to make a table to check that, you know, we have about equal numbers in each fold. Right, so here it's we have about 92 or 93 samples to assign assign to each fold number between um, one and five, which is good. And so now what we want to do is we want to designate one of these as a test fold. So let's call our test fold. Uh, let's say fold number one is our test fold to start out. So all right, our test fold number one is uh, gonna so all the or observations that have a fold number one. In our fold deck, those are going to be the ones that we want to consider as test observations. So here we're going to create a variable called is test. That's going to be a logical vector that's going to indicate whether or not a sample is in the test set. So here I'm going to say fold vec equals test fold, and so what that's going to do is, um, you know, this is going to create this logical vector in our, you know, a logical vector is displayed like this, low g. So it's, it's a vector of the same size as the number of observations in an SAR data set. It's just a bunch of true and false values, right? So if you want to see how these line up, take a look at a, a two-way contingency table. Well, so what is a two-way contingency table between, um, say, the is test and the full deck? What does that look like? Well, you see that all of the observations in fold one have been assigned to true in his test. All of the observations in folds two through five have been inside false in his test. So that, this is exactly what we want, right? So when we do cross-validation, the test set is, you know, if we designate test fold is number one, we want all of the observations in fold one to be in the test set, all the other observations to be in the train set. So um, we can further designate that with is train, you know, that's, not is test. So then we can use this for selecting the data for training and testing. So um, so let's do that. So like I was saying, the simplest algorithm, uh, one of the simplest algorithms for um, for classification or machine learning is the nearest neighbor classifier, and that's the class KNN function in R. And to run that, you, you know, you basically just have to give it the X train matrix, and then, well, let's look at that completion again. Um, yeah, let's look at that. Where is it? Is it going to come up? <laughs> That's funny. Okay, well, let's just pull up the help page. Or studio. Huh? <laughs> anyway, so it, if you type question mark in any R function, it'll give you the the uh, documentation for that function so you can see how to use it. So the usage is train, test, CL, and then the number of neighbors, right? So um, the 
So the train is the matrix of data frame of training set cases. The test is the matrix of data, data frame of test set cases. And then a factor of true classifications on the training set. So, so what we're going to do, so we're going to need to provide some variables like x train, then we're going to have to provide some variable called x to test, and then we're going to have to provide some variable called y train, where you know these are going to be the inputs for the train and the test set, and these are going to be uh, the outputs or the labels, the true classifications for the training set. So how are we going to do that? Um, we're going to um, first, you know, we have to take our x.se, that's our scaled version of our input matrix, and then we, um, we consider, let's define xtrain as the x.sc, but only the subset that corresponds to the training observation. So that's what the here the square brackets it means. Let's consider the subset and the first argument before the comma that refers to the number of rows. So we're subsetting the rows based on this is train logic, logical vector. So we create that. Let's create y train in a similar way, right? We take our y vec and we apply is train. We don't need a comma there because that's a vector. It's only a single dimensional uh, index. And then finally, our x test. What is our x test? Well, it's going to be uh, x dot sc is test. Uh, well, we should actually we need a comma there. So I'm surprised that didn't give me an error. So here, let's take a look at these things. x dot train is a matrix with 369 rows. x dot test is a matrix with only 93 rows. So that makes sense. Remember, our test set was smaller than our train set. Um, also, Y train should be the same size as X train, right? 369 labels. Very good. So now let's um, let's run this and see what happens. So the default is K equals one nearest neighbor. So that's typically a tuning parameter that we should tune using an internal train validation, subtrain validation split. So we're not going to do that right now, just for simplicity. We'll, we'll do that in a future tutorial. So uh, let's just look at this. The vector, the value of the output is a factor of classifications of the test set. Okay, so let's let's call that pred class. How about that? Uh, so let's take a look at what that is. What is pred class? In our, this is a factor with two levels. It's either a zero or a one, right? So. Um, and so in our it's a factor, you know, so when, when we look at this, if we put this into a data table, you know, let's take a look at that pred class, you know, what this looks like is, you know, it's just a bunch of zeros or ones. That's how it prints when you look at it like that. Um, you know, if you just print it like this, it also looks like zeros and ones. But when you look at the structure here, the str call that I did before, it says a factor with two levels, and two, one, one, two, two, et cetera. So a bunch of ones and twos. So what is, what is that? So in R, we have this data structure called a factor. And that is uh, basically a representation for you know a categorical variable with a number of different classes. Here, the two classes are zeros and ones. And, you know, the ones here correspond to the zeros, confusingly, and the twos here correspond to the ones, right? So, um, so yeah, this is a kind of a don't don't worry about this. this. is a little bit of a point of confusion, but we can get a um, something that is comparable to our labels, because like what we want to do now is we want to compare what is the error of the the, these predictions relative to the actual labels in the test set, right? The actual labels in the test set we haven't created yet, and so the algorithm doesn't know about them. But let's create them. So y test is actually y vec is test, you know, based on what we've created before, right? So, you know, y test, what is y test? You know, this is a bunch of integers with zeros and ones. So actually, we can look at a contingency table of y test and Pred class and see what it looks like. So this is what we call a confusion matrix in binary classification. What it says is that um, <clears throat> we have 
the zeros, which are predicted, uh, you know, 46 zeros, which are correctly predicted, 17 ones, which are correctly predicted, and then there's some false positives. That's uh, labels that are actually negative, but uh, sorry, actually negative, but predicted as a positive, like these 11 guys. And there's some false negative labels that are actually negative, uh, are predicted as negative, but are actually positive, right? So, um, so that's the confusion matrix, uh, but you have to be careful to when you're predict when you're computing the prediction error here, because um, because here you want to be able to compare um, either uh, thing some some things of the same type. So so here if you do a um, comparison of y y test. So, so here, you know, the, the y test is an integer. So if you do as integer of the pred class, I'll try to get a pr predicted class, you get the ones and twos. So that's not going to work if you compare that to the, the y test, which is just zeros and ones, right? So actually, to get the right kind of integer prediction, you have to do as integer paste pred class. Then you get the zeros and ones that we're looking for. And so let's call that pred int, you know, to emphasize that that's an integer. And then after that, we can compute the prediction error. Let's say um, is a prediction error is prediction error. That's that's what happens when pred int is not equal to y test, right? And so when we look at that, you know. That's a, a logical vector is pred error. You know, that's either true or false if you got it right or wrong. And, you know, if you take a look at the mean is pred error, that's the, um, that's the percent of predictions that uh, you got correct. So does that agree with the table that we have here? Um, yeah, it does, right? So it looks like we got most of them correct. You know, there's a minority of predictions on the off diagonal. So that, that kind of makes sense, right? So uh, alternately, we can do sum is pred error. It's not sum of the prediction errors is 30. So does that agree with the table? Yeah, 11 plus 19 is 30. So that does make sense. OK, very good. So that's how you do a basic um, um, machine learning model and compute a basic prediction error. So in the next tutorial, we'll talk about little more details about how to visualize the, those prediction errors.